Welcome to season two of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement, and a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to the public health news of the day through informative interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today's Friday Q&A podcast, Stephanie Desmond asked me a bunch of questions about COVID, the White House, FDA, and well, let's listen. Josh Sharfstein, thanks so much for joining me again. Thanks, Stephanie, for having me on your podcast. (laughs) Or your podcast. So uh, today I'm talking to you, my favorite public health expert. I want, before we launch in, I really want to remind people of your resume as an expert in the field. Not only are you one of the deans of the School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins, but you're also, you have previously served in leadership positions in the Baltimore City Health Department, the Maryland State Health Department, and the FDA. So you definitely bring the right credentials to this conversation. And I wanted to start today our Q&A with a question about public health messages, mostly surrounding COVID and the White House. So I feel like we're getting a lot of conflicting messages. We're hearing um, he's not wearing a mask, even though he has COVID, the president. He's uh, telling us not to be afraid of COVID. It's just like the flu. How damaging are these statements to all the efforts that public health officials have been undergoing? Well, I think it's important to take a step back. This is a pretty serious outbreak. And it looks like the White House is at the center of it, that the virus was inside the White House and is being transmitted from person to person, most likely at that ceremony related to the Supreme Court nomination. And um, there are still a lot of people getting infected and it's not over. So it's, it's a pretty serious public health event on its own merits and hope that everybody who gets infected recovers, but also we hope that it gets contained as quickly as possible, which requires a a good public health response. And the other thing just to take a little bit of a step back on is this question of messaging. And if we go back to the beginning of the pandemic, when there are no treatments, no vaccines, then messaging becomes like a treatment or a vaccine. It becomes the tool that the government and experts and uh, others use to help people understand what's going on and to, so that they can change their behavior to to keep themselves and their families safe. So communications and messaging, it isn't just telling people, keeping people posted. It's giving them information that they can use to stay alive, basically, in the middle of a pandemic. And one of the key principles, and this is a principle I teach in my class on public health crisis, it's a principle that I I've taken from the CDC's guidebook on public health communications and crisis is that it's really important for communications to be clear and consistent. So people are hearing the same thing from multiple channels. And the example that they give is, you know, imagine someone sitting watching TV, uh, watching their favorite sports game, and a little note gets on the bottom of the screen, like uh, there's a hurricane or tornado coming your way. You should seek shelter in your basement. You know, well, they might just do that at that point, or they might change the channel. And if it's on every channel, it's like, yikes, there's a tornado coming. I'm going to go to my basement. But if at the same time you get that message, you get a text message and it says, don't believe anyone talking about a tornado, or you change the channel and someone's saying, who even knows whether tornadoes exist really? I mean, have you touched one? Then, you know, people may not go downstairs. And usually when there's that kind of confusion, people take the path of least resistance and they don't change. And I think that's what we've seen in the United States, where there's so much confusion over what to do. Some of that, you know, linked with the political situation that people don't know what to do. So I think that these current messaging uh, issues with the uh, White House are on top of a lot of confusion, a lot of, you know, poor messaging about mass, about the need to take this seriously. And so I think they make a bad situation worse. Mm-hmm. And we talk about this in my work that um, at this stage, sort of in a in an outbreak, uh, communications is all we have. 
That's right. And, you know, I know you work at the Center for Communications Program with Johns Hopkins. And when you say it's all we have, um, I think an important point is that it can be a lot. Communications can be incredibly effective. Communications campaigns help, you know, curb the HIV epidemic in different countries. It's dramatically reduced uh, smoking in, in different areas. There are amazing campaigns that Center for Communication Programs has, has led and informed around the world collaborated on that have led to enormous challenge just through giving good, consistent messaging that people can use to protect themselves. And we've squandered that tool, I think, in the United States. And we're seeing the effects of it in so many people sick and dying. I want to switch gears a little bit. And I want to, last time we spoke, we talked about uh, the vaccine and the FDA. So what has happened with the vaccine this week? So it's been a pretty interesting week, kind of a bit of a roller coaster. Last time we spoke, we were talking about the importance of the Food and Drug Administration uh, being able to do a solid review of the data about vaccines uh, before deciding whether they're safe and effective for the population. And, you know, that importance is still here. It's really important that people who know what they're doing are looking at these studies and see uh, whether these vaccines prevent COVID and whether they're safe enough to take. And there's been this question of whether the agency will be able to do that or whether there'll be interference from the White House. And we started this week on Tuesday with news stories in the New York Times and the Washington Post saying the White House was not going to let the FDA apply the criteria that it thought best to a vaccine, which was kind of stunning. It said uh, the White House thought they were too strict, that it should be easier to get a vaccine to people. um, And the FDA was wrong. And uh, that uh, was was pretty amazing. But by midday, the FDA had sent out its criteria to its advisory committee in an appendix uh, to a briefing document. And they said, you may be interested in what we're telling companies they need to do in order to get a vaccine authorized. And they put all the criteria that they were planning to put out in the guidance. So then there was a whole second round of stories that said FDA managed to get its guidance out despite the White House asking for a lower standard. And then the White House changed its mind and said, okay, you can release it as a guidance. You've already released it in this this strange way as an appendix to an advisory committee document. Just put it out. So now the, the new guidance that FDA wanted wound up on the FDA's website. And there was another round of stories that said White House reverses itself and clears guidance. And it was like, okay, well, the White House is now sort of taking credit for doing it, but whatever, at least now the FDA gets to do what it wanted to do. And then the day finished with the president tweeting that he objected to the FDA standards and thought they were political and attacking the agency and the commissioner. So we sort of ended the day a little bit where we started, but with the big difference that in the middle of the day, the FDA really did get to put its standards in place. And I think what this shows is a couple of things. First of all, The White House has power, but it doesn't have all the power. People, I think Democrats and Republicans, it's not political. They want safe and effective vaccines. And they're going to trust the FDA to say what the right standards are. They're not going to trust um, the White House chief of staff. They're not going to trust a political, you know, uh, person in the White House to tell them whether a vaccine is safe and effective. And um, that, I think, was just very powerful. Uh, Second, I think the industry was... Uh, very clear that it wants uh, the FDA to be in charge here. And that they there there were statements to that effect. One of the interesting subplots of the day, and maybe we're getting too much into the details, but you can see how obsessed I was with reading every story, was that at one point the White House said, well, we want a lower standard because industry wants a lower standard. And so they were sort of uh, throwing industry under the bus on their, during that period where they were rejecting the standard. And I think um, that is not the case. I think that industry is fine with the FDA guidance. And I think probably told the FDA that it would be supportive of the agency moving forward. I imagine the industry feels that way because if uh, a vaccine is approved in a political way, it could really undermine the efforts to get people to become vaccinated. I think that's true. Now, I I do want to add one other point, which is on Tuesday, we had a a great event, which people can look up on the Hopkins website um, with the University of Washington, talking about the integrity of the vaccine trials and review by the regulatory agencies. And as part of that, I participated in a panel 
um, where we, we were discussing this with a senior FDA official and former FDA commissioner, uh, Scott Gottlieb. And one of the, the questions that came up is, well, you know, the industry really does want a strong regulator here for exactly the reason you said. So people have confidence in their products. That is very much a dynamic at play at the FDA. Then if that's the case, then the industry should be more transparent about the vaccine studies that are going on. And uh, Dr. Gottlieb pointed out that to a large extent, the industry is a lot more transparent about these studies than they typically are. They've released protocols. Um, one company is even pledging to release all the raw data to an intermediary so researchers could do their own studies of the vaccine. All that is progress. The question that I asked was uh, related to the fact that one of these studies is now on hold in the United States. And the typical way that the FDA handles a hold is they just let the company explain what's going on. And the company is not saying much, or maybe they'll say something to an investor group, and then there's some leak story. And, and you know, I asked, well, why not just have the FDA say, well, here's what we're doing to make sure this vaccine study is safe to proceed? Because there are a lot of people who may have gotten one shot, they haven't gotten the other shot. And uh, I think that the industry would be in a good place if they said, look, FDA, please feel free. Please talk to the public about what's going on with our study. And that way people can have more confidence in the process. I think FDA is following its usual guidebook of being pretty mum about these clinical holds on studies. But I think this is an unusual situation and an opportunity for the agency to, to do more. So another thing in the news this week has been uh, a drug, a monoclonal antibody from the company Regeneron. This is the drug that one of the drugs that President Trump was given for his COVID. Could you talk to us a little bit about their efforts to get an emergency use authorization and what that could mean? Sure. I think this may be more than one monoclonal antibody, but it's basically a, a cocktail of antibodies. It's a little narrower than plasma. You know, we've talked a lot about convalescent plasma, which has a whole bunch of different kinds of antibodies. Um, this is a company that's manufacturing the antibodies that it thinks are going to be the most helpful. And they're probably going to be the most helpful earlier in the disease, like we've talked about with the plasma. And so the president got that relatively quickly as an experimental treatment. The president was also treated with remdesivir, the antiviral drug, and with steroids, which is for people with moderate to severe, or severe cases, really, of, of COVID-19. So he got a lot of treatment. They were obviously quite worried about him, uh, given, given the situation that he presented with. Um, now, the president's come out and, and has said that he got better because of the this particular product, which, of course, is impossible to know. Um, but we all hope that it, it it's beneficial. And there have been sort of... Uh, a little bit of chatter that some of the studies uh, are looking good for it. Um, so there's a process for the company to provide data to the FDA, the FDA to look at that and decide whether it makes sense. And, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that it does. I, I don't think that it's realistic to think it's going to be a miracle cure, but I think it is realistic to think that it could provide meaningful benefits to patients and, and reduce even the number of deaths. But we're going to have to see from the data, just how, how good it is. Um, there's also going to be a challenge of manufacturing um, because uh, these are harder to manufacture. The plasma, you can just you know line people up and take their plasma. But for this, it's more complicated. Um, it's industrially manufactured, I think, and they're, they're just different uh, obstacles to getting to a certain scale. So I think it'll be the data, number one, and then the scale of number two that'll be issues for this treatment. The president was saying that he just wants to sign the, you know, sign some document and let this happen. It's not as quick as that. Well, um, it's not for him to sign. You know, actually, the law says it's uh, for the HHS secretary, and that's delegated to the FDA commissioner. And it really has a lot to do with the amount that they can make too. So, you know, and signing something without data um, doesn't help because doctors want to know what they're doing you know, and, and what the value is. So I, I think that if the data is strong, it really won't take very long at all for FDA to, to um, provide an explanation of its actions and move forward. But, you know, that, that's what has to happen. So also this week, the New England Journal of Medicine, a very highly respected medical journal in the United States, put out a an editorial called Dying in a Leadership Vacuum. And it talks about 
Trump's lack of leadership in this crisis, in this COVID pandemic, and essentially tells its readers not to reelect him. Uh, I'm going to read you the last uh, paragraph, and then I wanted to see your reaction. So it says, anyone else who recklessly squandered lives and money in this way would be suffering legal consequences. Our leaders have largely claimed immunity for their actions. But this election gives us the power to render judgment. Reasonable people will certainly disagree about the many political positions taken by candidates. But truth is neither liberal nor conservative. When it comes to the response to the largest public health crisis of our time, our current political leaders have demonstrated that they are dangerously incompetent. We should not abet them and enable the deaths of thousands more Americans by allowing them to keep their jobs. I think that's the sound of the mic dropping at the end. You know, it, it's pretty pretty um, unprecedented for a medical journal to take that kind of position. Certainly the New England Journal of Medicine has never done it before. And I think it reflects the tremendous frustration that many people in medicine and public health have knowing that many lives could be saved and many of the people who died didn't have to die. And, you know, this week is also notable for quite a tremendous letter that was sent by Bill Fahey, the former CDC director to the current CDC director, talking about how difficult the response has been and basically saying that he should resign if he's not able to tell the truth, saying that the, the current CDC director should be prepared to resign over this. And so I think that both of these reflect just a very strong sense by senior people in medicine and public health that this all wasn't necessary. Josh Sharstein, thank you so much for this really valuable insights that you shared with us today. Thanks for having me, Stephanie. Public Health On Call is produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, Stephanie Desmond, and Lamari Morales. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, Cian Oates, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Thank you for listening. Mm-hmm.